Good oh, you got me on the picture. You're good. You have me on the picture. Yes, yes, yes. I could see you. Good morning, Dr. John. I'm Dr. Bishwarup Roy Chaudhary from India Book of Records, the chief editor of India Book of Records. Uh, oh, good. Uh, you can call me Dr. B uh, because uh, my name is an uh, Indian name. You will not be able to understand that. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to congratulate you, sir, for your work. And uh, it's my pleasure and honor to, uh, to uh, talk to you you write like this and uh, uh, I have observed all your, uh, your all the videos I've seen and uh, as a, a India Book of Records chief editor and a president of Indo Vietnam Medical Board I have applied that knowledge knowledge from your video in uh, many of our patients and we have seen dramatic results in all of them in, in case of diabetes and heart disease yes sir and uh, I have a list of say more than 5,000 patients on whom me and my team has applied that method. So, the, so the reason for uh, 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 troubling you is tomorrow, tomorrow we are having our conference where 500 Indian doctors are joining, and they will be listening to this uh, this chat. So we are recording your your video, which will show you tomorrow in the in the conference. Good. I hope you got the. Uh the uh, video presentation that I sent? Yes, yes, sir. I have got the video presentation and my team is downloading that. I am sure that they'll be able to do it by the time we finish this. Uh, I, I think you'll like I think you'll like that a lot and hopefully you can blend two together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. I will put that also and uh, this chat also. And Thank you. Uh, I would like to start with uh, some questions, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, my 500 doctors, they would like to know how we can reverse diabetes type 1 and type 2 and what are the five or four important steps uh, to do it uh, the four five or four things which we must tell to the patient the most important thing to reverse diabetes type 1 and type 2 okay uh, you cannot reverse type 1 okay now plain and simple uh, type 1 is uh, a loss of the pancreas it's it's damaged it's not going to come back but type 1 diabetics need to eat well to prevent complications. Uh, type 2 diabetes by definition is due to diet and associated obesity. So type 2 is always reversible by diet change and associated weight loss. Now in between type 1 and type 2 is, is a spectrum uh, that I call type 1 and a half where you have uh, enough pancreas to make enough insulin to keep the patient out of ketoacidosis and out of the hospital. Right. So you, you make enough insulin with that, but you don't have enough insulin to keep the blood sugar normal. And so these type one and a half diabetics, they'll run elevated blood sugar even when they're thin. Right. Now the way type two diabetes works, the why you have why type two diabetes occurs, is it's a natural adaptation to taking in excess calories. What happens is the body takes in excess calories and for survival, it's always about survival. Right. For survival, the body puts on an extra 20, 30, 40 pounds in the summertime and the fall to get ready for the winter. So it'll put, the body will naturally put on um, in, in kilos, what are we talking about? Uh, 10, 20 kilos the body will put on. But then the, it gets to the point where it's no longer a survival advantage to gain extra fat. At that point, the body may think things like, if I get fatter, say I, I, I put on 40 kilos, 80, 100, 100, 100 pounds, then it won't be to my survival advantage. For example, I won't be able to climb up a tree and get away from a tiger or I won't be able to get in a cave entrance. In other words, you, the body gets to a point of fatness where it's no longer in its best interest. At that point, and let's just guess that's 40 to 60 pounds or 10, 20, 30 kilos. What happens at that point is, is the body develops insulin resistance. Right. Uh, the insulin becomes less efficient. The insulin receptors, they downregulate. And uh, as a result, insulin doesn't work. Don't just keep gaining more weight. But when insulin doesn't work well because of this downregulation, because of in insulin resistance that develops, then the blood sugar also goes up. 
Right. Now, what, what you will see occasionally as, as doctors is you'll see patients who gain more, you know, they gain 100, 200, 300 kilos. They'll gain four, five, six hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. And you'll look at these very, very obese people. You'll expect to see terrible cholesterol, terrible blood pressure. You'll expect to see terrible artery disease, but you don't. And the reason is these special people who get massively obese, they don't develop insulin resistance like the normal person does. So they don't become diabetic. They become massively obese, of course, and hurt their lower, lower extremities, their knees and ankles. But they don't develop insulin resistance. Uh, Insulin resistance is a normal survival mechanism that the body takes, and that normal adapt adaptation is called type 2 diabetes. You remove the stimulus for developing insulin resistance, which is the diet, and what happens is the insulin becomes sensitive, the body lose, loses weight on a healthy diet, and the type 2 diabetes always goes away. It's 100% curable with weight loss and a good diet. Even, even without a good diet, type 2 diabetes, your countrymen, your fellow doctors know from, uh, from the surgical journals, you, you know from bariatric surgery, if you take overweight people with type 2 diabetes and you do bariatric surgery on them, the cure rate is 80 percent. All you have to do is cause them to lose weight uh, with any diet, the Atkins diet, the low-carb diet, uh, you can uh, cut off their arms so they can't get food. You could do anything to cause them to lose weight and type 2 diabetes is curable. The best way to cure type 2 diabetes, though, is to feed them the healthiest diet, which is the diet I teach and which is the diet people in India used to follow, a diet of dal and rice and potatoes various starches, that cures type 2 diabetes. Great. So what are the implications of uh, consuming milk and animal product uh, as far as diabetes is concerned? We're continuing, I'm sorry. The implication of uh, drinking milk uh, in health. Well, okay, that's, that's uh, mostly a type 1 diabetes issue. Right. Uh, milk, milk consumption, cow's milk, in some people, what happens is the cow milk protein goes into the bloodstream and causes an autoimmune reaction because this is a foreign protein, cow's milk beta casein. Uh, the beta casein portion has been identified mm -hmm. as entering the bloodstream. The body makes antibodies and the 17 amino acids that the body makes antibodies to that cross-react and cause type two, type 1 diabetes, those 17 amino acids have been identified. So cow milk protein goes into the bloodstream. The body makes antibodies to the to 17 amino acids on the beta casein segment of the cow milk protein. Those same 17 amino acids are found on the beta cells of the pancreas. So through a process called molecular mimicry, the body makes antibodies as it should to this foreign cow protein that's floating around the blood. But these antibodies also attack the pancreas and cause type 1 diabetes. And by the way, half the people who get type 1 diabetes are older than the age 19. So it's not just a childhood condition. And that's how you get it. The pancreas is destroyed within three to five years and it's gone. You can't get it back. Type 2 diabetes, the pancreas functions very well, makes as much insulin as somebody without diabetes, often twice as much insulin. The only thing they share in common is that both have elevated blood sugar mm -hmm. and complications, mm -hmm. which you can prevent. And that's why you want to feed a type 1 diabetic very healthy, is a type 1 diabetic has lost their pancreas, they have a, uh, a serious handicap. Mm -hmm. They have this metabolic handicap and they can't defend and repair as well as somebody without diabetes. So you take a type 1 diabetic with a serious handicap and you feed them the, the rich Indian, uh, European, American diet full of meat 
and, and yogurt and cheese and chicken and whatever, and they fall apart rapidly. They go blind, kidney failure. I've seen type 1 diabetics treated with a healthy diet who 40 years after diagnosis, their eyes work, their kidneys work, they're in good shape. They just require insulin. So all your type 1 diabetics, in addition to uh, giving them insulin, which you have to do, you need to feed them well to keep their parts working, you know, to keep their body functioning. So here, uh, I would like to share my observation. The diet which you recommend, which I learned from the video which I have seen of yours, uh, we put many patients, who, uh, children basically, who are type 1 diabetics and we have some cases, as many as 10 children who are out of insulin totally and they Good. are uh, doing with the diet uh, which is very close to what uh, you recommend. So my question is... Uh, I believe that. Yeah. So uh, uh, do you think that they are not diabetes type 1 or wrongly they are diagnosed as diabetes type 1? They must be what, 1.5 well, or something? Well, they're, yes, I think they're 1.5. They're in what we call a honeymoon phase, which you commonly see. Uh, what happens is uh, the, the beta cells, the pancreatic cells, they get attacked, they get inflamed, the child gets very sick. It's, it's not always a child, but in this case, the child gets very sick, may develop ketoacidosis. The medical intervention saves the child's life. But uh, that acute insult, that inflammation of the pancreas, resolves to some extent. There is left a deficit of beta cells, of insulin cells, but there's still some left. Because the most children in India, in the United States, in Europe, uh, when they're treated by doctors, they get them out of ketoacidosis, which is, of course, crucial, but they keep them on the Western diet with milk. And so the autoimmune reaction, the mechanism being molecular mimicry, the autoimmune reaction continues, and over the next few months or so, they destroy the rest of the pancreas, unless you change their diet. Right, sir. Sir, I would like you to share something about uh, plant-based food versus animal-based food, uh, the, the comparison. Okay. Uh, are, are we still talking about diabetes? Yes, in, in, in connection with the diabetes. And lifestyle okay. disease as such. Well, if, if say when you get an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, uh, type 1 diabetes, thyroiditis, uh, hypothyroidism, uh, all kinds of autoimmune diseases, the way you get these autoimmune diseases, the beginning step is to damage the barrier between the gut and the blood. Uh, this gastrointestinal barrier is damaged, you have a leaky gut. And what happens is proteins leak into the bloodstream. Now, if these are animal proteins and the body makes antibodies against these foreign proteins, because we are animals, human beings are animals, what happens is these antibodies are similar, or, or excuse me, the antigens, the proteins on the animal food are similar to the proteins in our own bodies because we're animals. So they cross-react the body is making antibodies against the beef or the pork or the cow milk protein and it finds similar protein amino acid sequences on our tissues and so it attacks our tissues. Now if a plant protein gets into the bloodstream the body can make antibodies to that plant protein but we're not plants so it doesn't cross react. Those antibodies made to the beef or uh, cow those antibodies uh, attack the foreign animal tissue, or excuse me, those antibodies that attack the foreign animal tissue attack us because we're animals. But if they're made to plants, the antibodies are so dissimilar from ourselves that they don't attack our own tissues because we're not plants. That's really great, sir. Very simple. Uh, I've seen one of your video where you explained about the Steve Jobs, sir. So, uh, 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 the cause of his death. Uh, would you like to uh, share some your views for our Indian doctors? Uh, well, who is this? Ca whose cause of death? Uh, uh, who is Steve, is Steve Jobs? How he died? And Steve, your understanding Job, about the Apple it. guy. Yes, okay, sir. that's a that's a great story about how did Steve Jobs die, the founder of Apple Computer. That's in my November 2011 newsletter. 
and it's uh, it's got some attention. Maybe a half a million people have seen it, maybe more. Uh, Steve Jobs died of pancreatic cancer, and uh, in my opinion, he was terribly mistreated by his doctors. And I and I say that not that they weren't well intentioned. Uh, Steve Jobs, the richest man in the world, and one of the greatest contributors of the 20th century, changed our, the reason we're talking today is in part because of Steve Jobs. He got ca pancreatic cancer probably when he was a teenager working at Hewlett-Packard Hewlett uh, building computers. Uh, he got uh, some kind of environmental poison, uh, maybe one of the metals. It poisoned his pancreatic cells and they turned into cancer cells. That was when he was a teenager. He died, I think, in his mid-50s. Uh, it, took, it took 30 probably 30 years for that cancer to grow from one cell in the pancreas to a whole body of, uh, of pancreatic cancer cells. When he was diagnosed, uh, the doctors uh, uh, falsely told him, conveyed to him, I don't know their exact words, that if he had the pancreas removed, his life would be saved. So he went through a major surgery then the disease within a couple of years spread to it had it had already spread to his liver decades before but they found it in his liver when they did the surgery and then they went later on when his liver failed they did a liver transplant well steve jobs believed that the doctors were going to save him along the way he couldn't be saved he had cancer all through his body you know decades before they found it and he he should have been told that himself major surgery, liver transplant, uh, chemotherapies, all kinds of things that he was put through. The other thing the doctors, in my opinion, did that was uh, harmful uh, to Steve Jobs is they encouraged him to give up his vegan diet. For Steve Jobs, this was more than just a health issue. This was a moral issue. He was concerned about the environment, about animal rights, and the doctors told him that if he ate continued his vegan diet after they discovered the pancreatic cancer that he'd be malnourished and he must eat meat and uh, you know other animal foods and uh, Steve Jobs eventually caved in and did it but the things they told him were untrue his vegan diet was in my opinion his vegan diet is the reason he lived for three decades with pancreatic cancer rather than dying sooner and to ask a man who believed for such strong moral reasons to start eating animals under false pretenses to me is a is a is a, an insult to vegetarians Steve Jobs to intelligent people you can read uh, all about this you can read about the doubling times you can see by extrapolation that Steve Jobs had pancreatic cancer for 30 years uh, at least yeah. Uh, the medical business, as they do in India, in the United States, they contribute to the, uh, to the misery and the death of cancer patients with few exceptions. And we're talking about uh, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Current therapies are uh, a serious harm to the patient. Sir, I have gone through your uh, newsletter uh, in which you have uh, written a letter to Bill Clinton uh, way back and uh, about his health issue. I would like uh, you to uh, just uh, uh, give some uh, brief about it, about the whole incident. About Mr. Pritikin? Uh, about Bill Clinton, sir, the president of USA, the former president of USA. In one of the newsletters, you have written oh. a letter to Bill Clinton. Oh, Bill Clinton. Sure, sure, Bill Clinton. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton uh, became vegan as as a result of multiple problems. Our forty second president. Right. Uh, he uh, and by the way, I'm waiting to meet with your Prime Minister Modi anytime. Oh, great sure. No, I, I'm anyway. Bill Clinton he got into trouble with heart surgery in 2004. He had bypass surgery in 2010. They put some stents in him. And uh, after his stent procedure in February of 2010, he decided to change his diet. 
and he changed his diet to the kind of diet I recommend. I think I was in, of influence, but there are other doctors who I'm sure were of more influence, like Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Codwell Esselstyn. And uh, he changed his diet in March 2010. And Bill Clinton is a powerhouse. He's, you know, he's more handsome, more powerful, more strong looking today, which is five years later than he was. Yeah, and, and the, reason, the whole reason is, is he became vegan. He eats the kind of diet that I recommend. Now, Al Gore, do you know, you remember Al Gore? He was the vice president. Yes, yes, yes. I, he, he, is now, he is now vegan. He has lost, I would guess, just from seeing his pictures, about 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of famous people, for their own sake, are changing their diet, and that spreads to other folks. But, yes, but you, you're, you're, you have examples of, of vegan people all throughout the Indian culture, uh, healthy people. This is, this is so obvious. You, you know I was in India about five months ago. Yes, sir. We tried to uh, meet you, but uh, I think that in Delhi you did not come or uh, one of the one of your events was yeah. uh, rescheduled or cancelled, so we could not meet you. I, 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 I feel bad about that. It's unfortunate. But um, I met a lot of very intelligent uh, Indian physicians who knew this. I mean, they knew from their grandparents and their great-grandparents about a healthy diet based upon grains and root vegetables and legumes and uh, they had seen how in India the last 30 years the uh, dairy product intake has doubled the intake of, uh, of uh, vegetable oils has doubled and they've seen how the population in India has become fattened and sickened everybody who looks can see this uh, in the United States People have been blinded by the Western diet for maybe 80 years. In India, it's only happened for 30 years. So people can still remember when folks were healthy, when heart disease was rare. And they can see what happened. Sir, uh, I want you to share the connection of oil the, with the lifestyle disease. How oil in, uh, connects with lifestyle disease. Right. The mechanism of it. Well, oil, when we talk about oil, we're talking about free oil. We're not talking about um, oil mixed up in an orange or mixed up in a banana or even nuts and seeds. Now, there's lots of oil in nuts and seeds. Oil, when it's mixed up with the other plant parts, is safe. When it's mixed up with protein, vitamins, minerals to form a banana or a lentil. Uh, in that mixture it's safe to consume. When you take and reach into the bean or into the corn or the olive and you strip the oil out and you leave all the protein, vitamins, minerals, etc. behind, you're no longer dealing with a food. This is oil. No, this, is a, this has become a glass of oil. This is not, this is not food. Uh, as a result, this isolated concentrated nutrient is very powerful in its effects. It has pharmacologic effects. And all of your doctors know this. All of your dietitians, all the, uh, probably everybody does. That this oil, excuse me, say, <coughs> this oil, it uh, is highly concentrated, so it uh, is easily absorbed into the body and and put under the skin as obesity and it's put on the skin and people can develop oily skin and acne. Uh, the oil has pharmacologic effects. Let's just talk about omega-3 fats for a minute which is you know pop people commonly known as uh, fish oil or flaxseed oil. Omega-3 fats uh, are well recognized to suppress inflammation so they make arthritis pain less. And everybody applauds, expresses inflammation. Well, that's the positive effect of a drug called oil. It suppresses inflammation, and as a result, cancer cells grow uh, more uninhibited, more rapidly. This is shown in 
in uh, people studies in terms of uh, uh, studying folks who have cancer, the animal research is, is absolutely conclusive for, you know, almost 100 years they've been doing research on animals and oil and cancer. So you suppress the immune system. You also get more infection because you've suppressed the immune system. The other well-recognized effect of oil is it thins the blood. So doctors prescribe oil for their patients who uh, they think will have a plaque rupture, a thrombus formation, and they'll prescribe uh, omega-3 oils, particularly fish oils. They'll prescribe uh, oils to prevent the blood clot from forming in the cardiovascular system, which gives the stroke or heart attack. Well, it thins the blood. Oil thins the blood. It's one of its pharmacologic properties. When you thin the blood, you're more likely to bleed to death. And so people who eat a lot of uh, fish oil, like Eskimos, are known to have fatal nosebleeds. And if you take oil, and I've seen this in patients, they take fish oil, and they bleed. You can watch them bleed. Uh, you'd add fish oil and aspirin, which a lot, of, a lot of cardiologists do for their patients to thin the blood to prevent another thrombus from forming. These people are also bleeding. Uh, because of that combination just from everyday activities and if they're getting a major accident then it's really a big deal so, so the, the oils pharma it's a drug at best so the oil uh, we can find a connection in case of heart disease in case of ca cancer oil leads to cancer oil leads to heart disease oil leads to diabetes uh, can we say this in simple language well that, that you, you just made a very complex statement that has uh, many different points of view. When you say oil leads to heart disease, it does. Vegetable oils, you can look at studies done on populations of people who are switched from animal food based diets. These were done in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. They were switched from animal fat to vegetable fat, mostly omega 6 fats, and uh, they found more severe artery damage. Okay, that's that's true. These are these oils are toxic to the artery walls. But the there there's the other part of this whole artery story, which is when the arteries are damaged, they form volatile plaques, which rupture, and cause a blood clot to form. And that part of the argument is that fish oil thins the blood, so you're less likely to get a clot. Uh, it's a much more complicated story than I could explain or that I even know the answer to. I just know little parts of the uh, parts of the story and what you say is true. Vegetable oils are toxic to the artery walls. They thin the blood. Uh, vegetable oils have been shown since the 1920s to promote cancer. Uh, Kenneth Carroll in the 1940s did classic research growing animals on various kinds of diets and they put them on high corn oil diets uh, corn oil and they had much more cancer than even animal fat now the detailed explanations as to why maybe some of your audience knows you have I'm sure some very smart scientists there that can talk about the prostaglandins and talk about uh, uh, relative hypoxia that's created and uh, uh, cellular changes that occur with high concentrations of oil. Uh, some of this is known. Uh, yes, uh, that's probably the best I can tell you is that oil is not natural. You don't find any oil, any free oil, this is water, any free oil in nature. It doesn't exist. It's always mixed up with vitamins, minerals, proteins, and so on. It's always mixed up with these. Uh, other components that make the oil safe and most effective. And, and the way it makes you obese, I mean, the oil, this is the la one last point I, I want everybody in the audience to think about is when you eat oil, you, know, you, you like you drink, you know, you, I know you wouldn't drink it, but say you put half of this on your salad or on your fried cheese or whatever, uh, when you consume this, it must go someplace. It may end up in the toilet with some greasy water. Uh, it ends up, where does it go? 
it ends up under your skin. So this is why you see a fattening population of people in India. They're wearing all this oil under the skin and they're getting oil on their face and getting greasy skin and acne. When I was in India, I would say, I would say things to my medical audiences like, uh, China is the fattest, most diabetic country in the world. And people would stand up in the audience and say, you're wrong, it's India. India has the fattest, most diabetic people in the world. But see, that's just been in the last 30 years. Uh, in China before 1980, there was almost no type 2 diabetes, fewer than 1% of the population. 90% of the diet was rice in China before 1980. You can see the same story in India. Before 1980, before, uh, uh, before the quote industrial, massive industrial revolution, before the technology boom, before the financial uh, rise of India and China, people lived on rice and dal and potatoes and uh, all kinds of vegetable foods. Dairy was uh, rare in China. I know it was common in India. I know you have a long tradition of ghee and yogurt, uh, but that's a that's a, a food of the rich people in India. There's a, a Dr. Singh who wrote an article about people in India that was in the Lancet. It's an easy article for me to share. Uh, it's an article in the Lancet which took people from India, wealthy people from India who had type 2 diabetes and they just took the ghee out of their diet mm -hmm. and they cured in a matter of a few weeks, cured about 60% uh, of the people with type 2 diabetes and then over, that was only over a few days and then over the next few months they cured another about 20% of the people in India by just taking the ghee out of their diet. This was published in The Lancet. Everybody sees this. Yes. All you have to do is open your eyes, you'll see it. So if you stop the cause of disease, in other words, if we figure out that eating all this animal food and all these oils, vegetable oils, are, are the things that are making people sick, if you stop doing the things that make people sick, then they naturally heal. Just like if you, if, if you hurt your hand, you take your hand and you scratch it every day, you develop a sore, uh, and that sore stays there until you stop injuring your hand. Then once you stop the injury, it naturally heals. It's the same thing with the arteries and the bowels and the rest of the tissues. Once you stop injuring them with the fork and spoon, then the body naturally heals. That's all it is. It's just natural, innate healing that, that occurs in everybody's sight. Every doctor sees it. Every patient sees it. You just have to come to the conclusion the way that you allow healing to dominate is to stop the injury. Yes. So I would like to uh, like you to put in light how a heart patient can develop a collateral arteries. What kind of food he must eat so as to develop collateral arteries for avoiding a further heart attack or further heart failure? Okay. Heart disease is caused by the rich western diet. Cigarettes, smoking maybe adds a little bit to it. So to prevent heart disease, which is a modern disease, well, it's, mo it's modern uh, for most people in the world. You can find heart disease back 3,500 years ago in the pharaohs of Egypt, in the priests, priestess, the queens, the kings, the, the, the royalty. You can find it 3,500 years ago in the mummies. So it's caused by eating rich food, meat, vegetable oils, even even uh, chicken, uh, you even see atherosclerosis in Eskimos from, uh, from 500 years ago. When they, when they find frozen Eskimos in the tundra up, up in the northern latitudes, they will do autopsies in their body and find out these people living on animal you know, animal blubber have horrible atherosclerosis. Yeah. So the way you prevent it is you don't eat the animal foods. What you eat instead, this is very important, is that we discuss what you eat instead. 
a lot of folks there are sitting thinking, well, if you take away my yogurt and my ghee, and I know there are some non-vegetarian folks in India, you take away my meat and my, my, uh, my chicken, what am I going to eat? What is there left to eat? That's the important question to answer. What is there left to eat? What's left to eat is what your grandpa and your grandma used to eat, which is dal, which is uh, bread. That's that's the, your traditional diet. That's what you eat. Uh, sir, two, two, two more questions sir, for you. Uh, one is, uh, is there uh, the calcium from the milk and the calcium from the plant, do they <coughs> work differently when it enters the body or do they work in the same manner? The calcium in, from milk and the calcium from plants, oh, there, there's there's a difference in how uh, how they're absorbed and metabolized because other components. But the real question is, uh, in my mind, is there sufficient calcium in plants to grow healthy skeletons? There is uh, enough in plants to grow elephants in India. Yeah, uh, they don't uh, drink milk after weaning. So there, there's, lo there's loads of calcium in plants. Uh, if you consume dairy, uh, dairy products will stimulate bone growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the way they do that is dairy, dairy is a food for growing. Uh, dairy milk grows a baby elephant to a big elephant or to a, you know, they, they naturally consume milk. It's, it's a food for growth. So if you feed dairy, uh, you can expect that your body will grow. So adults grow. They grow bigger, bigger bones, bigger muscles. They age faster and die younger. And it also stimulates cancer growth. Maybe it stimulates people being fat, too. The dairy industry seems to think it makes you skinny to feed a food designed to grow a calf from 60 pounds to 600 pounds. That's what cow's milk does. They, treat, they teach people, I, I'm sure in India, and they have in the United States, have taught people the way to lose weight is to drink milk. Figure, I, I don't, they can say anything. They have all the money. I know the dairy industry in India is very powerful. It's, it's a huge industry. They control, like in the United States, they control the information. They have the, the money. So one connected question, sir, and the last question also. Uh, wherever uh, me and my team goes, in India and especially in Vietnam, in two places, Indo-Vietnam Medical Board, Board works, uh, we popularize the diet which you suggest. And we have seen a dramatic uh, improvement in all kinds of lifestyle disease, including, sir, even cancer and heart disease. and. Uh, bone disease, and diabetes, okay. and uh, one question which audience normally ask that is if this diet is so powerful, why no government is uh, taking a step to promote this kind of diet in spite okay. of all the positive results? Sir. I know, in spite of the fact that the research is absolutely consistent, why are the, uh, the liars winning? Uh, why, when I went to India, why did they talk to me about uh, low carb diets? paleo diets, uh, the Atkins diet, wheat belly, grain brain. Why are these so popular? Why doesn't the Indian government step in? Why doesn't the US government step in? Well, it's because of the dairy industry. They control the government. The US government tried to step in back in the 1977. The US government uh, under uh, our senator from South Dakota, George McGovern, set up the dietary goals for the United States, which said to the American people, we need to reduce the intake of animal foods. Uh, that was in February 1977. By the end of 1977, the dairy and meat industry had completely changed the dietary goals. In 1985, our Surgeon General C. Everett Koop published uh, the Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health, which is supposed, was supposed to be similar Luther Terry, Luther Terry's report on smoking and health that was published in 1964. In 1964, our Surgeon General uh, almost, you know, 
changed the, the tobacco industry in this country. Back in uh, the 1970s, half the people smoked. After the Surgeon General's report on smoking, the rate of smoking in the U.S. dropped to fewer than 20%. Uh, we hurt the tobacco industry in the United States tremendously. What we did, of course, is ship our tobacco to India and Africa and Asia. Uh, the same thing almost happened in the 1970s and 80s to the food industry. The Surgeon General, the government, tried to stop the food industry, but they fought back. They fought back with a vengeance, and they said this will never happen to us. And so far, here we are in 2015, they're right. They, they have won in the United States. They've won in India. They've won in Africa. They've won in uh, China. They've won in Japan. They win because they have all the money. That's why they have all the money. We have, you and I, and the doctors listening, have truth and success on our side. The scientific literature is consistent. There are liars out there. Maybe that's not a polite word to say, uh, but these people lie. They distort science and repackage it for the willing consumer, the person who wants to hear it's good to eat meat and dairy. People love to hear good news about their bad habits. So that's the problem. They got the money. People want to hear it's good to smoke cigarettes, drink alcohol, and uh, eat fried chicken. Uh, but they don't want to hear that they have breast cancer or diabetes or heart disease. And it's the food that's killing them. It is the food that is killing people and uh, doctors who want to help their patients. And I know all the doctors listening want to help their patients. You may have a different method. Uh, my guess is your method is not working for chronic disease. Think about our method. This method is time-honored. It's been used for thousands of years. It is founded in your religious teachings. Yes, it is. Whatever religion you have, it talks about eating a vegetarian, vegan diet. And that animal foods make you sick. It's founded in your history. It's founded in all the science. So it's kind of up to you and I to step forward and make a difference for our children and grandchildren. That's great, sir. And finally, uh, uh, before we finish this, uh, this chat, sir, uh, Indo-Vietnam Medical Board, our team from Vietnam and India, we would like like your name as an advisor to Indo-Vietnam Medical Board. Uh, sir, we'll be uh, sending a formal letter to you. Uh, okay. But, but uh, since I got no opportunity to you, so uh, can I ask you, would you be, uh, 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 would you be accepting our offer as a in, as an advisor to our board, sir? I'd be honored. I, I would be happy. I, the, the biggest problem I've had, as have my predecessors who had tried to help people, the biggest problem is getting a, a, a stage to get an audience. Uh, to have people like yourself welcome our message uh, is something I'm very grateful for. I, I'd be happy to tell you the things I've learned over the last uh, 40 years. I, I've, as you know, I've written it down. I've recorded it on video. And so it's out there for everybody to see if they want. And all you have to do is fact check. Just check the facts. Take your device out, and if somebody says uh, eating uh, saturated fat is good for you, uh, do the fact check. Uh, if I say the things that I say to be true, just do the fact check. The research is there. The truth is the truth. Yes. So, uh, sir, uh, thanks for giving your time, sir. And uh, tomorrow, uh, sir, this, this video will be there uh, in between uh, 500 doctors will be watching. And uh, uh, if they have any question, I would uh, take another opportunity to send you a mail. Uh, with your time, you can send back the answer, okay. which will I'll forward to all my doctors uh, Thank uh, you. from India and from Vietnam. And I'll take many more opportunities uh, to talk to you, sir. It's a great pleasure talking to you. And I've been and my team, uh, they have been uh, practicing the what you teach after learning from your videos. And well, you guys, you guys are uh, obviously are enthused and and are carrying the torch on. Congratulations. I know you feel good because your patients get well. Right, sir. So, it was uh, a pleasure. Thanks, sir. Pleasure, sir. Thank you. Bye to everyone. And you, you want to let them know that they can get all this free on YouTube and at our website, drmcdougall.com. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They know they have said and further share this video and the other video which you uh, shared with us today. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Have a good conference. Bye-bye.